Good morning. I wonder if you had the choice, the choice to go to any event you could pick, um, any event, like a sporting event or a gig or a concert or a stage show, something like that. I wonder what it would be. What have you always dreamed of going to? And what lengths would you go to to get yourself a ticket? If you had the money, if you had the time, would you go and camp out on the pavement for a couple of nights to get into Wimbledon maybe? Would you go and camp out online for hours and hours and hours in an online queue to get tickets? I, I met with Rodri Darcy recently for coffee, out of the coffee shop and on the table he had his phone with some kind of live stream hooked up to a camera at home that was trained on his computer screen um, count, and on the screen there was a countdown to the front of the queue online to buy Coldplay tickets. He'd rigged up this system so that even while we were having coffee he could just make sure that he didn't miss his place in the queue. I wonder what lengths you would go to to get those tickets. Well, the story that we've got today in Luke chapter 13 is all about an enormous event. The event to end all events. Or maybe re really we should say the, the event that begins the next chapter of human history. At the end of our history, Jesus says there's going to be a great banquet. You'll look through if you carry on reading. We're going to pause in Luke for a bit on Sundays. But if you were to carry on reading the next few chapters, you'd see banquets come up over and over and over again. It's how Jesus describes what heaven is like. It's going to be a huge banquet. He's going to be at the centre of it. We're going to get to be with him forever, enjoying, eating, drinking, being merry for eternity. But there are some people who miss out on the banquet. I mean, the guest list is amazing. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the prophets in the kingdom of God. Jesus is speaking to Israelites at this time, and those were the kind of heroes that they would have had. If anybody's ever asked you that question, like, if you could sit down at a, at a, at a meal with anybody in history, alive or dead, who would it be? Who would be your top three people you'd want to spend some time with? Well, if these Israelites were to answer, I reckon some of these names would have been on their lists. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, some of the great prophets. All these people are going to be there with Jesus in God's presence, feasting forever in this banquet in heaven. But Jesus says, while everybody's invited, not everybody is going to make it. There's a narrow door, but it's not going to be opened to everybody. I mean, it's open right now. History hasn't finished yet, so it's open. The invitation is open to come to the banquet, but there'll be a day when the door is shut and it won't be opened anymore. The banquet will have started, and if you're not there, it'll be too late. Jesus says that in verse 24. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try, but won't be able to enter. So we've got two things I want you to see today. First is that there's a narrow door. I'm going to try and explain what that's all about. There's a narrow door and we should strive to enter it. That's the first thing. And the second is we're going to see part of Jesus' heart. We're going to see an open wing, open wings that we should welcome. We should welcome the warmth of his open wings. That's going to be the second thing. But let's have a look at this narrow door. What's that all about? Well, Jesus says there's only one way to God. This isn't the only place that he says it. He says it elsewhere even more clearly. He says things like, I am the way, the way, the, the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Other places he calls himself the door and says that, that he's the door for the sheep. If you want to be one of his people, part of his flock, you have to come through him. It's the kind of thing that he's saying here, isn't it? There's a narrow door. Anyone can come to it. But you can't go through just anyone. It has to be Jesus. He is the narrow door. He's the only way to heaven. We have to come and, and not just have a passing acquaintance with him, but we need to embrace him wholeheartedly. We need to know him, not just know a little bit about him. I wonder if you saw that in the story as we went through. These people knock on the door and the master says, I don't, I don't know who you are. I don't know where you've come from. Sorry, you're not coming to the banquet. He says it two times. It's a tragedy, isn't it? I don't know you. Well, where you come from? Those are words that should drain the blood from our faces, that should make us feel sick, that should bring tears to our eyes. They're serious, they're terrifying words, aren't they? They're tragic words. That in the joy of this banquet, there are people who are missing out, who are outside, outside the door looking and, and wishing they could be there. But time is up. But they did know about Jesus. Did you see that? Jesus says, I don't know you or where you came from. And they protest. They say in verse 26, we ate and we drank with you. 
You taught in our streets. We heard you preaching. We sat down at dinners with you. Doesn't that count for something? And Jesus says, no, it's not enough just to have some passing acquaintance with me. You need to have embraced me wholeheartedly. You need to know me and I need to know you. Jesus says that's how you get into the kingdom of God. So when people strive to enter it but, but don't make it, it's not because they've tried to be good, but they haven't been good enough. It's not that kind of striving. It's that we should be having a single-minded focus on Jesus, getting to know him and him knowing us. And that, that should be a lifetime thing. Um, the word uh, strive is actually the, the Greek word that we get our English word agonize from. And it's, it's not really about pain, it's more about single-minded focus that's ongoing, that's constantly. This is about walking with Jesus, about getting to know him. Not just about having kind of heard a little bit about him in RE lessons once in a while. Or, you know, heard about him from a, a Christian friend or, or a Christian family member. Popping along to church every now and again. It's not about that, it's about walking with Jesus day by day so that he knows you and you know him. That's how you walk through the narrow door through Jesus and Jesus alone, not just by casual acquaintance, but by wholehearted embracing, receiving him. You receive him, so that when you knock on that door, he receives you. Do you remember he said this just a couple of chapters ago? Ask, seek, knock. Ask and I'll answer you. Seek and you'll find me. Knock and the door will be open to you, but one day the door will be shut. It'll be too late. If you say no, 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 and keep on saying no, well, one day time will run out. See, Jesus had been with his people, um, these people in Israel, for a long time. He'd been eating, preaching, healing, repeat, each, eat, preach, heal, repeat, eat, <laughs> preach, heal, repeat, day after day after day after day. And in fact, not just in Jesus' time, but through the whole of their history. Through the whole of their history, Jesus, our God, the one who made us, had been dealing with them in a really special way, rescuing them from Egypt, helping them in certain cir circumstances, teaching them how they should live, sending the prophets to speak words directly from him. He'd been, he'd been seeking them out time after time after time after time, and every time they would say, no, not interested, not interested, not interested. And then here he was, God himself walking in the flesh, in their world, and they said, no, not interested. We don't know who you are. And Jesus is warning them and saying, one day, there'll come a day when I'll say the same to you. You need to welcome me and receive me if you want me to welcome and receive you. I wonder what you think about that. I wonder if you think the idea that there's only one way to God is just arrogant. Um, well, let's think about it for a minute. I think it does sound arrogant to begin with, doesn't it? To say that you have the only way to God when there's all sorts of other religions, all sorts of other ideas around in the world, all sorts of good people seeming to do good stuff, don't they have a bit of the truth as well? Maybe you would like to use a picture, like, it's quite a famous picture, blind men trying to describe what an elephant is like by touching it. So maybe you would say that's what religions are like. They all have an idea of the truth, but they're all kind of perspectives on one big, big truth. So one blind man has the trunk and he says, oh, oh this elephant is like a snake. And another blind, element, um, a blind man has a hold of the elephant's leg. And he says, oh, no, 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 the elephant is not like a snake at all. It's solid and, and firm and it, you can't move it. And it's much more like a tree trunk. And another blind man has hold of the side of the elephant. He says, it's not like a tree trunk at all. It's not round. It's, it's more like a wall, huge and flat and slightly furry and dirty. And, and we stand back and say, there's what religions are like. They all have a little bit of the truth, but not the whole truth. So can't we just agree to disagree? Can't we agree that all of us have another path up the mountain? But do you see the arrogance of that? The only way that you can say the blind men each have a little bit of the elephant and they don't have the whole truth is if you're the only person in the story who can see. You see the arrogance of that? That if you say all religions are basically the same, they all have part of the truth, then you're claiming to have huge knowledge. You're claiming to have this kind of exclusive total knowledge that you're, you're saying nobody else is allowed to have. So you're saying Jesus can't say he's the only way, but in saying that you're saying that you know he's not the only way. That, that means you must have some kind of extra knowledge. You must be able to be on a helicopter looking down on the mountain, seeing that all paths lead to the top if you were to change the picture. See, that's arrogant in itself. And, and thinking that we're right isn't actually something that we can escape. 
It's not arrogant to think that you're right. You can be arrogant in thinking that you're right. You can be judgmental and look down on other people. You can be proud about it. It doesn't have to be the case. In fact, all of us think that we're right. We wouldn't live the way that we do unless we thought we were right and that other people were wrong there. That would kind of necessarily follow, wouldn't it? So it's not necessarily arrogant to think that you're right. What's really important is to have beliefs that lead you to humility, that lead you not to look down on other people. And I think that's what believing in Jesus does for us. If you see that Jesus is somebody who doesn't just say he's the only way, but who makes a way for us to know God by dying for his enemies. If you believe that, that God came to this world to die for his enemies, that even as he was dying, he was forgiving the people who, was, who were killing him. If that's what God is really like, Jesus dying for his enemies, and you take that into the center of your heart, that's what it means to become a Christian, wholeheartedly receive and embrace that. If you make that the foundation of your life, then you, you shouldn't be an arrogant person. You can't be, can you? Looking down on people because you know that the only way to fix my situation is for God to die for me. So I must be pretty bad. So I have no right to look down on other people. If God had to die to fix me, to save me, there's no excuse for pride, for judgmental arrogance. Jesus says he's the only way. It's not an arrogant thing to say. It's actually a very natural thing to say if he really is who he says he is. If he really is the son of God, if he really is the original creator, the one that we came from, if he really did defeat death and rise from the grave, if he, if he is actually alive today, if he is the only true God, then it's just natural that, that he's the only way to God, isn't it? That unless you come to him, then you're going to some other door where there's no banquet. You're missing out on Jesus. If he really is the God we were made for, then to turn away from him to go some other way would be to shrivel up and miss out on life and miss out on that banquet. If Jesus is really who he says he is, who we've been seeing he really is through the book of Luke, then it makes sense. It's only natural. The only sensible thing is that he is the only way to come to God because he is God himself. I wonder if you've come to know him. That's really the question here. Um, the man at the start of the story says, Lord, are there just going to be a few people saved? Will it be just a few? Jesus turns his question round and says, will it be you? Don't worry about how many or how few. Ask the question, will it be you? Will you be there? How far will you go to make sure you're at this event? In the kingdom of heaven with him. Do you know him? Does he know you? Do you have more than just a casual acquaintance with Jesus? A little bit of kind of dipping your toe in, in the shallows of religion. Do you have more than that? Do you know Jesus? Does he know you? Have you embraced his teaching? If you haven't, then this is where we need to stop today. Just to pause. Maybe you can pause the video if you like. Pause and think about why or why not. What's stopping you from coming to know Jesus? What questions do you still have about whether it's true or whether it's real or whether it's good? What doubts do you still have? Well, pause it, pause the video, write down those questions and then carry on um, if you like and make sure you find answers to those questions before it's too late. If you have pretty much had all your questions answered and you're not really sure what's stopping you, well then pause the video right now and pray. Can I lead us in prayer? Maybe we can do that right now. Let me pray an example kind of prayer that you could pray um, to come to Jesus, to ask him to get to know you, to ask, ask him for more than just a casual acquaintance, to ask to be one of the people who walks with him, who strives with him, one of the people who will be welcome in his banquet. Can we pray together? And then we'll carry on. Lord Jesus, we ask now that you would help us. I want to pray for those who are wanting to start this journey today. Now, Lord, we come to you, we bring ourselves to you, and admit that we've so often walked in different paths, we've so often knocked on other doors, we've so often not listened to your voice and just dabbled in religion but not really come to know you. Lord Jesus, we're sorry for that. And we want to ask that you would welcome us today. We want to ask that you would take us through that door today, Lord, that we would know you, that you would know us and that we would begin today this life of walking with you, of striving with you, of looking forward to this banquet with you. Lord, we pray that you would take us, that you would come and know us and help us to know you, that that would begin today and that you would give us the strength to walk with you all the days of our lives until we walk through that gate, through that doorway into your eternal banquet. Amen. 
Amen. Well, maybe you want to pause the video and pray that prayer for yourself now. But let's carry on. Let's have a look and see an open wing. Because I wonder if at this point, Jesus closing the door in the faces of people makes you feel a bit awkward. Makes you feel like, how can he do that and be good? Does he, does he enjoy judging people? Does he enjoy slamming the door in the face of those who slam the door in his? Well, the answer to that is no. If you heard earlier on reading the second part of the story, you'll know. You'll have had a glimpse into Jesus' heart where he says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thinking about the people of Israel, looking at this great city. He says, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent to you. How often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. You were not willing. You see, the reason that Jesus closes the door isn't because he likes to do it. Isn't because he enjoys seeing the pain of people shut outside. It's because they've shut the door in his face. It's because they don't want to come and be under his wing. They don't want to follow through the narrow door in his terms. They don't want to treat him as God, as the God that he is. They want it on their own terms. And so time and time again, through the whole of Israelite history, through the whole of the time that Jesus was there, even, even till after he had died for them, they were still saying no. His arms were outstretched. His, like a mother hen, wings were outstretched with downy, warm welcome. He just longed to comfort them. He wants people to be saved. He wants you to come and know him and walk with him. And yet people didn't want to. They said, no thanks, we've got something better to do. We're not convinced. And Jesus weeps over that. That breaks his heart to turn around and say, okay, your house is desolate. I'll leave you to it then. It's a tragic thing. Jesus doesn't enjoy judgment. Jesus doesn't relish it. It breaks his heart. And so, where does that leave you? Are you somebody who has broken his heart, who keeps on saying no to him? Or are you somebody who's made him jump for joy? Who says, who makes him say, oh, welcome. Your place is set. The time is now. I've been expecting you. Welcome home. You see, that's what he says to these people who've been coming from the east and the west and the north and the south to take their places. The people who don't want him, he says, I don't know who you are or where you've come from. The people who welcome and receive him, he says, I know exactly where you've come from. You've come from the east. You've come from the far north. I know. I saw you. I know who you are. And I've set a place just for you in the kingdom of God. Well, what are our lessons for Christians? If you're a Christian following along this today, um, this is what Jesus is like. This is what his heart is like. He loves to see people come home. Well, do you love that? Are you as patient as he is? Think of that. You could look through the contents page of the Bible and see how patient God has been through all of Israelite history, doing wonderful things for them and with them and through them. And then doing wonderful things in Jesus. Even after this point, not just eating, healing, preaching, but dying for them. That's where he's going. He's on this road up to Jerusalem. That's why he says, on the third day, I'll reach my goal. It's a little hint at the third day when he would have died and then risen again. Jesus knows he's going to die for these people and he's willing and happy to. He wants to do that, even for his enemies. Jesus goes to great lengths to open that door so that we could, anybody could, whatever we've done, we could come in and sit at his banquet. So are you, if you're a Christian, do you have that kind of patience? Do you have that kind of heart for the people around you? The kind of, I don't care how many times they say no, I'm going to tell them again. I'm going to pray for them again. I don't care how many times they hurt me. I'm going to forgive them again. I'm going to, I don't care how long they think they're my enemy. I'm going to love them. I don't care how much harm they do to me. I'm going to forgive them and welcome them as God has welcomed me. You see, we should be the most patient people on earth. Our churches should be places that are just dripping with grace, dripping with forgiveness, not even a hint of a judgmental looking down on you kind of eye. No, Jesus, time and again, eats with people, preaches, speaks to people, heals people, and then dies for people to keep that door open, to be patient so that anyone, everyone could come through. But some people still say no. So one, will we be patient? Two, will we be courageous? There's this little bit about Herod, Herod's, Herod's death threat to Jesus. And what's his response? Well, he's very bold. He's very courageous. He says, go tell that fox. And that was a bit of an insult in these times. That was, you, would, you were calling somebody kind of conniving, sly, also weak. 
and also damaging and just it was not a good thing to call anybody let alone a king jesus is courageous and he says herod this is what you're really like and i'm not going to stop i'm going to carry on today tomorrow the next day i'm going to do it until my time is done until my work is finished so is that your attitude as a christian i wonder what god has called you to do i wonder why he's put you on this earth have you ever prayed about that have you ever asked what gifts he's given to you what opportunities there are around you what has he given you to do that nobody else can do What's your job that he's specially commissioned you? Well, take courage and do it. Don't worry about the threats of people. Don't worry if, even if it's a, a king who's threatening to take your life. No, follow Jesus in his courage. Watch him as he sets his face towards the cross and says, nothing is going to stop me until I've done what God my Father has put me here to do. Nothing is going to stop me until my work is finished, until it's done, and I get to rest with him at that banquet forever. Nothing can stop you. God is in control. Nothing will stop you because he's the one who numbers our days. He's the one who says, tomorrow you'll still be here or tomorrow I'll call you home. Our time is in his hands. So will you use it wisely? Will you use it so that when the master comes knocking and sees what you have to do, will you use your time and your gifts and your commission well so that you have something to show? Jesus did that. Jesus went to the cross to forgive us for all the times we've messed that up. Jesus went to the cross to show us how we can follow him in courage. Jesus is patient with us to forgive us for all the times we're impatient with others. And then he calls us and gives us his same spirit to go and love people as he's loved them, to be patient, to be courageous, to follow that course to the end. I wonder if you'll follow him today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this great banquet. Thank you that heaven is a beautiful picture not a boring place with just harps and clouds and I don't know, eating custard on, <laughs> in a boring place. Lord, we thank you so much that heaven is a beautiful banquet full of wonderful people, most of all with you at the centre. Lord, we long to, to see you. We long to be the kind of people who, who know you and who you know so that when we knock on that door, you answer and say, welcome home. I've got a place set for you. I was expecting you. Lord, we pray that you would keep us, keep us from just dabbling, Keep us from being the people who reckon that we're close enough, but really just walk our own way. Lord, it's a tragic thing to miss that out. So we pray that you would keep us striving, keep us working hard to know you, to keep on walking with you, to keep on being courageous and being patient. Lord, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus, who's died for us, to forgive us for all of our failures, for all the times that we've turned back, for all the times that we've messed it up. Lord, we thank you that he forgives us, that he welcomes us, that he opens his arms, his wings, and wraps them around us if we'd only will, if we'd only say yes and walk through that door, walk into the, those arms. Lord, we pray that you would be with us today. Help us to welcome that invitation. And tomorrow, Lord, help us to keep on walking in that invitation. Looking forward to being with you at that banquet for eternity. Amen.